Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Uh, welcome everybody to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive and I'm super excited about my guest today because she's so beautiful and wonderful and I think is going to bring some really important information today um, to you about health and digestion and hormone balance and all the kind of things that, you know, we need to know in order to be healthy and happy. So uh, if this is your first time at the Heal Your Hunger Show, I just want to say welcome. So glad you're here. And um, this is where we talk about the deeper issues uh, regarding, um, you know, sort of why we're compelled to eat, why we're compelled to eat those foods that we know we shouldn't be eating. So, um, you know, I really uh, jump tracks, get off the whole diet and weight loss conversation and go deeper into what it is that drives us to eat, what it is that drives us to feel the need to numb out, and what are those emotions that we always want to numb out. So, you know, my, my conversations with my guests go in many different directions. And I think that's just wonderful because, uh, you know, as women who have struggled with food and weight, you know, we have a lot of different health concerns and, um, you know, both uh, on the physical side, the emotional side, and even the spiritual side. So that's why my guest is going to be so great today. And if you haven't joined us in the Secret Sauce group, jump over to Facebook and go to type in Secret Sauce to End Emotional Eating. And that's where we continue the conversation. And um, I offer uh, free classes and great conversation and support on your a journey of becoming whole. So uh, the secret sauce to end emotional eating, please join us over there. And now for our amazing guest, first of all, hi Brody, glad to have you here. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Trisha. Yeah, it's super cool. And we're, we're doing these far out and funky uh, backgrounds on Zoom right now because, you know, we're bored of our backgrounds. So <laughs> we, we've got the same thing uh, for both of us. We've chosen this. We actually match for anybody who's watching this. But for those who are listening, just suffice to say we're looking a little far out right now. <laughs> uh, a little uh, sort of psychedelic with our bright green, lime green backgrounds. But let me talk a little bit about you, Brody, just before uh, we get into our conversation so people know more about you. Uh, Brody Welch is a is a licensed acupuncturist, board certified herbalist, and self-care strategist. And she helps uh, self-aware and high-achieving women break the cycle of stress, overwhelm, and self-sabotage so they can enjoy the lives they're working so hard to create and really truly embody self-respect, which I love and I'm sure we'll get into. Um, she's a founder of Life and Balance Acupuncture in Corvallis, Oregon, where she's been treating patients since 2003. And she's also the creator and host of A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. And that's something I got to do is be on her podcast recently. So we're doing a little swap here. So I'm happy to have you uh, today on the Heal Your Hunger show. So again, welcome. It's so fun to get to talk to you twice in one week, Trisha. And <laughs> I, I really, I really appreciate the fact that you do go deeper than just the like that this kind of uh, control deny relationship that we can get into with food, because it's it really is. Uh, you know, I'm in this for people's transformation, right? Really getting to the the deepest possible crux, so that we can show up happy and healthy. And like it, it's it, and anyone that that claims that they have the secret magic bullet um, is is just, I, I think, really overlooking the complexity of of reality and who we yeah. all are. So it's uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to have a deeper conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you. And. You know, we did some, we covered a lot of good ground on your show and, and I just want to sort of uh, kind of take off from there because I loved um, when you were talking about digestion and I mean, you, your work is so wonderful because you do bring in, you know, these principles of Ayurveda and, uh, and Chinese medicine and, you know, those types of um, effects um, on our body and um, and from our bodies, right? And so, um, and I don't, you know, I don't play in that arena. So I love hearing about it. And I'm sure uh, people listening will love that as well. So let's just uh, springboard into uh, digestion, because anybody who's, you know, struggled with food and weight has put a lot of crap in their bodies, okay, and, yeah. and have probably affected their digestion. I mean, to be honest, when I was a kid, I was such an emotional eater way back when. And when I was a kid, I just remember every Sunday night, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on the show, 
every Sunday night, I was up in the middle of the night puking. Okay. Like every Sunday night I would have like this digestive issue and I'd, I'd be sick to my stomach and, and my mother, um, bless her heart. You know, I'd always go and get her and wake her up. She was a good mom and she would come and she'd rub my back or she'd bring me ginger ale and she'd help me. But it wasn't until later when I was really going through my, my recovery journey that I realized that I was puking because I'd overeaten all weekend long because I was stressed out in my family system, you know? And so that's, I spent my whole weekend binging as a kid, you know, not realizing, I just thought I liked to eat, um, you know, and, and it, it had such an effect on my body and my body was weak. My stomach was weak. It got stronger. I put it through enough that it, that it got stronger. But, you know, I think anybody who does abuse food ends up having some issues with their digestion um, because of that abuse. So can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it actually, before diving into that that discussion, it might be useful for people who are not familiar with Chinese medicine and its philosophy for me to just kind of uh, position this in that greater okay. context. Okay, I love that. So, um, so Chinese medicine, of which acupuncture is the sexiest branch that most people have heard of, um, also encompasses things like uh, its own philosophy on diet and really, uh, uh, and that food is not just a, a bunch of micro and macro nutrients, but rather every food has a nature right, um, and an energetic and a system of the body that it's good for and that it guides to. And so when we think about um, it, at the, the natures and energetics, uh, we think about the taste, right? So each of the five tastes, sour, bitter, salty, sweet, pungent um, and astringent uh, kind of a, is another one that's in there and, and also neutral, um, but that there, there are these tastes that we need to have in balance as well as temperature. Like anything that we put into our body is going to have a thermal nature that ranges on a spectrum from cold to cool, to neutral, to warm, to hot. And that what we're supposed to be eating, it is it, Chinese medicine is is all about the alignment of the the, the human body is an ecosystem that's interconnected with our external ecosystem, and that what is good for us changes depending on where we are in the cycle of the seasons throughout the year and in the cycle of our lives and like what you know what our needs are, which makes sense, right? Like, like babies need different foods than somebody who's like a you know training for a marathon, right? That just that we need different things depending on on what is going going on and that each of us have um each each of us has a constitution where certain systems are stronger versus weaker and that's kind of something that we innately come in with but also each of the systems of the body supports a different system and keeps another system in check and so like that basically that every uh, that that uh, the energy of the body is it's all one thing and it becomes hard to talk about so we need to subdivide it and the first major subdivision of how we talk about the body's energy is yin and yang so most okay. of us are familiar with that yin yang symbol, right? The black and white swirls with the little blop of of dot of color um, in, in in its opposite. And this is really a model of the universe, and it's also a model of what life looks like when it's in balance. And this is basically that um, yin and yang are these polar opposites. And just to fill that out, and they're opposites that not only oppose one another but support one another and are necessary for one another's existence. So when we think about that. But um, yang is the active, warming, dynamic, moving, external, forceful, protective, that kind of energy. And the yin energy in the body is the cooling, moistening, soft, yielding, nourishing, supportive, restful, calm energy in the body. And clearly we need both, right? Like that we can't mm -hmm. uh, just that we need both and we need both in each and every system of the body. And so when we just think about the yin and yang of life, um, most of us are in constant motion, right? It's like doing more, pushing ourselves, having, you know, a lot of uh, our whole society is obsessed with yang and yeah. yin is sort of demonized, right? It's laziness. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, that anything that's, and I would say it's even gendered, right? That yang is masculine and yin is feminine and yang is better, right? And that's, um, it's Yan, well, kind of, Yang sounds stressful to me right now. <laughs> oh, totally. Well, and, and that's, that's the nature of, of um, that, that's, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of people use food to ground ourselves is because yeah. life is fast and yeah. it's moving and it's intense and it's forceful. And it's like, so the, the opposite of that kind of energy, right, is this downward, inward kind of energy. So when we think about the different systems of the body, 
in Chinese medicine, we think about like the heart, the lungs, the spleen, the liver, et cetera. And that these organ systems are not just the organs that we know and love, but they're bigger concepts. So for example, the liver is responsible not only for detoxifying and uh, you know hormone synthesis and uh, uh, purifying the blood, all the things that it does, producing bile, but it's also responsible for the free flow of emotions in the body and keeping all the energy flowing freely in the body. So really there's always, a, the, the really like within each, each organ system, it corresponds with a taste, a sound, a color, a season of the year, just the, a whole slice of all that is. So really like if we can just pan back for another minute, that the, um, the, the energy, right, of energy is hard to talk about, so we need to subdivide it. We can subdivide it into yin and yang. We can also subdivide it into the five elements, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water, which each of which corresponds with an organ system. So when we're thinking about the digestive system, we're mainly thinking about the spleen and stomach, which are the captains of the digestive team, according to Chinese medicine. So the spleen and stomach are basically uh, the they they work together. One is a yin organ, the other is a yang organ, and they work together to help transform food into nourishment and to get that nourishment where it needs to go in the body. So it also corresponds with our flesh. It corresponds with um, our muscles. It corresponds with the taste of sweet because most food has some element of sweetness. That's how we know it's food and not poison, right? <laughs> that that yeah. um, in terms of how we're supposed to be eating. And so when when we're thinking about emotional eating specifically, we can think about that a lot of it is a need for sweetness in our lives. It's a need for, it's a need for, for kindness and compassion, which That's are the, sure. the, the emotions that we associate with the earth element. Mm. So that, um, which is also um, associated with the emotion of worry, right? Worry or like the concern for others and also compassion, right? All of these are earth element things. So, so this basically that the stomach receives the food and we can liken it to a cook pot, right? So if there's a pot on your stove, the spleen is like the little, is, is the, the gas burner, right? That is, that's underneath your pot. And it provides that digestive fire that's required to break down the food and turn it into something usable by the body. It's, so, it's, let me just interrupt for a second. Sure. Yeah. You don't ever hear about the spleen. Yeah, the spleen is a very right? underrated organ in Western medicine. And they, the Chinese were probably aiming at pancreas when they were talking about the spleen because it sort of nestled in there. But okay. um, And obviously, uh, the pancreas secretes insulin is responsible for our blood sugar balance and, and thus the sweet taste. But yeah, the spleen has a really primary importance in Chinese medicine. So I'm using the capital S version of spleen um, to yeah. signify that it it really is um it's a it's it's really the spleen and stomach together have that digestive fire that okay. it takes to digest life right so that so that's not only uh, we get energy from our digestion of food but also from our digestion of our life experience into something usable so when okay. something is like guilt you know like bogging us down or you know regret or um, shame, all these emotions that can make us feel heavy and sticky. It's um, There's actually a, a physical correlate that we think about in Chinese medicine called dampness, or in Ayurveda, it's referred to as ama. This idea of undigested crud that hangs out in the body and lingers. And some of its physical manifestations are like the ooey gooey sticky stuff. So like yeah. nasal discharge, um, like um, acne, um, vaginal discharge, mucusy things, cysts. Um, it, there, it can be. It could. It could also be things that are invisible, but are uh, like extra weight can be dampness. Brain fog can be dampness. Um, mm. This idea of like fog in the body, turbidity that is moist and lingering and the body's like, what do I do with this? I know I'll just stash it over here. So maybe it gets stashed in a joint and you get arthritis or maybe it gets, um, it gets shunted off and it becomes a little like fatty deposit somewhere. Um, or maybe it becomes uh, polycystic ovaries or, you know, some, something like that mm. where it's like the body needs to figure out someplace to, or maybe it's chronic nasal drippiness, right. Or, um, or seasonal allergies, that kind of thing. And so all of this can be a result of this damp turbidity that is really a product of inefficient digestion okay. and or giving ourselves too much of things that have a damp nature. 
So if I could give you some examples to let's maybe fill this it. out a yeah, little bit. Let's, let's, damp, um, let's dampen your life. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, so, so if you've got like, let's say that you just went camping and you made a campfire and you let it go all night long. So, so that in, over the night, it was just like little coals. And in the morning, if you wanted to cook something on that fire to have breakfast, like the first thing you would do would be what? Uh, to get that fire, fire going. Fire. Yeah, get to stoke the fire. Yeah. Right, get it going. You're going to have to throw, add some kindling to that fire if you're going right. to cook anything. Because it, and, and so uh, probably the worst thing you could do to that fire is to like douse it with cold water, right? Mm -hmm. So like getting up and having like a bunch of like cold, icy smoothie in the morning, like probably not optimal for digestion. You know, like I, that that smoothie could be made way better if you, if you were to have it at room temperature, if you were okay. to not have it super complicated. And if you were to add digestive kindling spices to it, like fresh ginger. Fresh ginger is a primo Chinese herb that stokes the digestive fire. Another really common one is black pepper. You know, just, just simply cooking your food is going to warm it up, right? So that same, you know, like instead of having like a cold, watery mess for breakfast, you could have something cooked, right? Have something mm -hmm. that where where you are, it's warm, it's cooked, and sort of soupy, right? So so traditionally, like a, a breakfast in China would be congee, right? Something like a like a ricey porridge with protein or with fruit or something like that, um, you know. But really, any sort of cooked breakfast that is of whole food nature um, mm -hmm. is is going to be a, an easier to digest choice. Uh, likewise, if you wanted to like really, um, it, like your campfire would struggle if you were to add like a giant cedar tree to it, right? If you were to just like... <laughs> Fell a redwood and throw it on your digestive fire. Like that's not gonna, it, like it would overwhelm it. And so having like a, you know, a huge steak for breakfast is also not going to be awesome for your digestive fire. Mm -hmm. You know, like just th overwhelming it with way too much, very dense, very um, hard to break down proteins and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so if we are to, so the things that digest best according to Chinese medicine is like, um, is soups and stews, things that have been cooked for a long time, or you've added basically cooking is like pre-digestion. And mm -hmm. so in Chinese medicine, we're big fans of cooking your food and having, you know, that, and certainly that's going to vary like in, in winter, it's absolutely necessary right now as we're moving into spring it's appropriate to be having like the, the little shoots and stalks that are coming up right now. So, um, so little sprouts and also things like asparagus and celery and, you know, th things like that, that are um, what nature is providing to us that, that, that actually is medicine um, for us right now. So eating with the seasons is always a great idea. Um, the other thing with digestive fire is that you can't have the fire cranked up all the time, right? That it's like, that's exhausting for the body. So there's gotta be this pulsation between fullness and emptiness, right? That if we're, if our, our digestive system is one long tube from our mouth to our anus, and it's like the food has to sort of sneak its way through, it's, it's very difficult to do that if we've stuffed the tube completely full, right? Yeah. That there's, there's gotta be this pulsation between that every, every, every part of the digestive process gets a turn. And so in Chinese medicine, we think it's really important to stop eating when the sun goes down. Mm, amen so, to that. Yeah, yeah. So just like, cause we're humans, we're supposed to be able to smell and like actually our, the digestive process starts when we, when we look at food and, and smell it and start thinking about it even. It's like mm -hmm. the, um, and if, uh, so we're not supposed to be eating when we can't see our food anymore. Yeah. And, having... and, non and nonstop without a break. Hence exactly. you know, putting some space between each meal exactly uh, which my clients know about the three meal magic which that is the drum that i mm -hmm. beat all the time well and and with good reason because really that that allows the cleanup crew to get in there and do their job and like they don't do that if the party's still going on and so that mm -hmm. that idea of meal spacing is chinese medicine would be all for it we also have this idea in chinese medicine that each organ system has a peak time of day where it really shines, where it gets the most energy. And so that's, um, and for the digestive system, seven to 9 a.m. and nine to 11 a.m. are the, the times that correspond with stomach and spleen. And so if, if, so basically making sure that you're eating something between, so, you know, basically like don't die today is what our ancestors would like to know, right? That, that not eating is a stressful thing. And mm -hmm. so giving yourself something, um, 
in those early hours of 7 to 11 a.m. And conversely, not eating at the flip side, right? That 7 to 11 p.m. is like, yep. there's, very, there's very little energy in the digestive system. It's not what's supposed to be happening then. And so just that idea. Um, but also having your largest meal of the day in the middle of the day instead mm. of the end of the day. There's a lot of research in circadian medicine. Um, you've probably explored that already on, um, on the show as it's been so popular in the past couple of years. But this idea of the when of eating and how of eating being just as important as the what if not more, you know, that the same calories consumed before noon, people will lose weight compared to the same calories consumed after 7 p.m. So mm-hmm. that, um, and, and so in general, it's like that if we think about usable calories, like it, that if food is there so that we can do our work, it's, it's there so that we can function. And so if we're, if we're eating our biggest meal of the day in the middle of the day, when the sun is highest in the sky, of course, it's the most young time of, of day. And it's like, it's going to enhance the fiery processes of our lives. And so among them, chief among them being digestion. So if we, if we think about um, following the, like using the sun as, as a guide and eating our biggest meal of the day when the sun is hottest and we have the most energy to break it down, that we'll be able to make better use of what we're giving our bodies. I love that. This is great stuff, Brody. And it's, you know, it does correspond so much with what I teach, but I'm teaching it from the emotional eater's perspective Mm -hmm. and not, you know, more emotional, spiritual, and you're giving us more of the physical and, and the the perspective from the, the, you know, the Chinese philosophy as well, which I've always been so amazed at how intelligent, you know, and how ancient, you know, Chinese medicine Mm -hmm. is and how just how just how beautiful it is, you know, whenever I've, you know, read about it and, and um, learned different um, tenants from it. So I love that. Um, so let's talk more about, um, you, you had mentioned early on about the energetics of food. And, yeah. um, and I know you've mentioned that from the cooking and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but what other kind of energy in food should we be mindful of? Um, well, let's see. That's a, yeah, it's a really deep question. I'm trying to think about what people would most appreciate the answer to be. Um, I started talking a little bit about dampness earlier, and it's worth noting that that probably the most damp things we can be consuming are refined sugar and dairy products, okay. right? If we ju- and and also gluten, right? The root word of the word gluten is glue. So talk mm-hmm. about something that's sticky and heavy and hard to break down. And dairy, it's like we know is mucogenic. And so again, it's like it, that what these things have in common from a from a biomedicine perspective is that they're hard to digest proteins. Um, but what they have in common from a Chinese medicine perspective is that they are um, that they're heavy and sticky. Right. That's their nature. Right. As opposed to um, something like, oh, you know, a lettuce leaf. It's like not not so heavy, not so sticky. Right. So in general, vegetables are going to be more cooling and detoxifying. Animal products like meat and uh, poultry and things like that are going to be more building to the body. And of course, you can think about it as a spectrum. You know, like there's it. And and the more refined something is, the more exaggerated its nature is. So in other words, like having an apple is very different than having the nutritive essence of 12 apples that have been juiced and like, you know, throwing that down in like four sips, right? Yeah. And, and we know that, that it's basically, it's, it's essentially the sugar without the fiber that, mm-hmm. that has a very different effect on the body. And that like we wouldn't do if we were living, you know, like our ancestors used to live, that, that kind of thing would be a rare indulgence that would only happen when apples were in season. It wouldn't happen every day, first thing in the morning, you know, like with right. orange juice. That, things like that. So, so we think about like food in it as close to its natural state as, um, as we can. Also the idea of making sure that we're getting a balance of all the tastes, that that is something when we think, like when I think about a satisfying meal, I think about protein, fat, and fiber. But also when we're thinking about what's a satisfying meal is, is um, does it have all of the tastes represented? And so that could just be a different way of, of, of framing um, giving yourself something satisfying because considering, you know, like, oh yeah, like that, that little, and it doesn't have to be much, right. It can just be a little bit of, you know, a lemon wedge or like, you know, for, for the sour taste or bitter is a hard one to come by. There's not very many naturally bitter foods except for things like chocolate and coffee and beer, you know, which is maybe why we crave those things. Who knows? Um, But the, 
bitter arugula? green. Arugula? Yeah, arugula. yeah, exactly. Yeah, arugula. Um, the, the leafy greens that, you know, especially the, the dense leafies, chard, kale, things like that um, yeah. tend to give us the bitter taste. And the function of bitter is that it transforms dampness and clears heat. So if we have a lot of inflammation in the body, we need to be eating more bitter and cooling things. Um, and if we're constantly cold all the time, right, if we've done a number on our metabolism or that, you know, that if we're, if we're just that struggling to keep warm, we're going to need to use more warming spices, more, that, more things like cinnamon and, and ginger and cardamom and clove and fennel and things like that, as opposed to, so thinking about like the constitution, the nature of what's out of balance in your particular ecosystem, because food can either take you in the, uh, the direction of be, being medicine for that condition, neutral, or actually making that condition worse. Mm-hmm. So it's um so it's the kind of thing where like yeah if you if you identified with that like carrying extra weight feeling kind of drippy and sticky and having you know brain fog and you know carrying around a lot of guilt and shame it's like yeah like dairy and refined sugar is not going to be medicine for you you know that right. um that's like cooking your food um and and not having not having things in their exaggerated refined form is going to be really important yeah. so. So when we think about food energetics, paying attention to your own ecosystem and what is what might be going on there. So a lot of people, like one of the most common diagnoses I make as a Chinese medicine um, practitioner is um, that of qi stagnation, right? That, which is basically akin to stress, right? When we're stressed, we're tight, we're tense, we're stagnant. And so what's going to be the antidote to stagnation? Like just in, in general, uh, movement. movement, right? So movement, something that does this, that's going to be spicy, right? Like that. Okay. that um, so, to, the, um, so yeah, a little onion, garlic, you know, something yeah. that like moves up and out or pep, like, that's going to be on the warming side. Something on the cooling side could be something like, uh, like mint or um, cilantro or, you know, something that again, it's like, it does this, it moves upward and outward. Each organ system keeps another one in check. And so when we think about too much energy pent up in the body, right? Tight neck and shoulders, um, the uh, side headaches or headaches at the top of the head, PMS, breast tenderness. These are all liver chi stagnation symptoms, symptoms. Okay. maybe insomnia, waking up at 2 a.m. You know, like there's so all me, of that. So, so you mean the energy in our body's not moving? Yep the, yep. the liver is responsible for that free and easy flow of energy in the body. And when okay. we're stressed out, you know, like the, the liver Contraction. makes everything, yeah, tightens up, contracts. Mm-hmm. It's so the smooth flow of chi disrupts our cycles, whether that's the menstrual cycle, whether that means that we're getting like, you know, food moving in the wrong direction, acid reflux, that kind of thing, or just maybe IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, um, is that like food is moving either too fast or too slow through the body with pain involved. Um, it screws with our natural rhythms of being able to fall asleep and wake up. So the, so if the liver keeps us in rhythm and stress takes us out of rhythm, that one of the most important things that we can be doing for our liver to start to feel like it's relaxed, at, that, um, that, that, Basically, it's we need to breathe because it's the lungs that keep the liver in check. So I always recommend that people go back to their breath when, um, and that and that actually can really change your relationship with food, right? If we're eating in a stressed state, the whole, the energy that we use when we eat goes throughout the entire life cycle of of that morsel of food through our bodies, and. Yeah. Um, so making sure that we're in a in a relaxed state when we eat. Also, since the spleen is responsible for the digestion of information and the digestion of our lives, it's really nice to not being like multitasking, working or studying while at the same time trying to eat because you're trying to process on multiple levels at the same time. I always um, say that. Put it on a plate, sit down and turn off the noise. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So in terms of like if you are... It, the most important thing I think for people who are living in a state of stress is to try to transition into a parasympathetic state before eating. And the breath is really the, just the best way to do that. Long, deep breaths into the low belly. And that's um, what we consider natural breathing from a Qigong perspective. Qigong meaning energy cultivation or energy skill or basically the, the cultivation, using your own energy for medicinal uh, purposes, essentially. Okay. And that's something that I teach as well. So that can be as simple as putting your hands on your low belly, inhaling and inflating the low belly and exhaling, letting the low belly move towards the spine. 
and just giving yourself that freedom, like just not being, not judging, just allowing the breath to do its thing because the breath has to be like where the breath goes, the energy flows and our mind can direct that. And so when we, when we think about dropping into a state of relaxation and using the breath to help that, literally we can't be digesting well if our energy is all up here, which is where, what happens when we get stressed. Our energy rises and doesn't sink. It also enters and doesn't exit. So most of us need to like, especially if we find ourselves sighing, right? We need to let that go. We need to let it go before taking in. I love all that. That's wow. You've given us like a crash course in Chinese philosophy and medicine and Ayurveda. (laughs) (laughs) My plan is working. There's so much wisdom and (laughs) I'm noticing that this background is making my teeth green. I I don't actually, I don't actually have spinach going on. It's the green stuff. It's really funny. It's sort of like someone putting a yellow yellow highlighter to your front teeth. It really is. It's not my best look. Most people are listening, not watching. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, well, I mean, there really is so much wisdom in Chinese medicine and being able to teach people how to apply it to their lives, especially when they've looked through so many lenses and they don't understand why they still feel bloated all the time, you know, or that they still, like, that's, that's, uh, or the, or why they can't poop every day. It's like that just fixing those two things is not hard from a Chinese medicine perspective. And wow. then people feel more comfortable in their bodies and they're more in tune with how food affects us, right? It's it's easier for the stain to show up on the clean shirt than it does on the dirty one. Mm-hmm. So like when we when we get to a point of of really feeling like we should feel better after we eat, not worse. You know, like it's so having like signs of 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 healthy digestion in Chinese medicine is going to be like that you actually notice that you get hungry and that you yeah. feel better after you eat and that you are satisfied by it and that there's no pain and that you are eliminating the distance between uh, your elbow and your wrist every day without the aid of caffeine and mm. that you you know that you don't feel distended or bloated and that there is a clean taste in your mouth that's not bitter or sticky or metallic and that you know that anyway all all sorts of things the absence of skin issues the absence of of um, cloudy thinking, the absence of lots of things that can that can relate to how we're digesting, and so being able to pan back and like if we can if we can create a healthy relationship with our digestive system, then we are more likely to notice. Oh yeah, that didn't really work for me, or like oh yeah, when I had that that spicy Thai curry last night, I did wake up in the middle of the night feeling hot, you know, or that just that recognizing oh yeah, that like increases like too much heat from what we're consuming leads to potentially inflaming heat conditions that we might be experiencing. Well, you know what? I just had an aha and that's that, which, so I'm going to check this out with you. I've had a rash on my arm, my forearm, like Mm -hmm. even during this show or this recording, I've itched this a few times so that my forearm, I have this rash and it's definitely bumpy on my skin but I make it worse because I itch it and then I get these little scabs. Mm-hmm. So it feels mostly like it's coming from underneath my skin, right? Yeah. And it's just itchy all the time. It sometimes wakes me up in the middle of the night. And I'm like, you know, is this stress? Is this COVID? Is like, what's going on here? But I just, I just made a connection, which is I have started to like, like sneak a little dairy, like a cheese specifically into my diet where I was dairy free for years up until I'd say the last six months. And I'm like putting a little bit of cheese, regular cheese, not vegan cheese um, on like my, my eggs. Or, you know, if I have some kind of um, salad or something, I'll shred a little bit of cheese. And I'm like, maybe my, cause I don't feel mucusy, mm-hmm. but maybe that's from that. Maybe I should. Yeah, it really that, could be. Right. It could be that they're, generally speaking, anything that's inflaming the lining of the gut is going to show up on the skin. And, and okay. so, um, and I couldn't quite tell, but the, the, on the arm, uh, we have both the large and small intestine channels. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, it's that's like, right like here. Yep. Yeah, uh-huh. That looks like large intestine to me. Um, so yeah, it very wow. well could be that something is inflaming your gut. 
I think that's um uh, that would be a worthy experiment to to yeah. see if, if you cut out the cheese if it goes away. I'm gonna do um, it. I'm, hopefully, you heard it here. So I'm I'm committing yeah. right now. I'm gonna do it for two. What is it? What's a good test? Like two weeks or something? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't okay. even think you'll need that long necessarily. But okay. there's um, yeah, because it and and usually just like even how things show up in the skin. If it's more um, just red and itchy, that might be more of a heat sign. Whereas if it's like raised and red and like there's any sort of wetness to it, we do think about more of a dampness picture. Interesting. Well, I would never have put that together if you hadn't been here. So thanks, Brody. Thanks <laughs> for that. Help. The lady with the yellow teeth is telling me how <laughs> to fix my body. <laughs> so talk to me. Before we close here, I just want to um, I want to tie in your coaching because you do work with people remotely. Obviously, you're not just doing acupuncture yeah. in Oregon. Um, and how do your how does your coaching? Do you teach people about eating and, and digestion, this kind of thing while you're helping them with their lives. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know anyone who has um, an, an emotionally charged relationship with food that doesn't also have an emotionally charged relationship with some other aspect of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I, I have training in meditation and Qigong and yoga, as well as Chinese medicine as well. So I, I really do look at the mind, body, spirit all together to help people figure out kind of like what's missing, like the energetics of life, like anything that we can be doing in our life can take us in the direction of balance or in the direction of disease. And so with my clients, I just looking through the framework of energetics, um, they learn a lot about how to take care of themselves through this different lens. Um, it, I have, and, and I, essentially I teach people how to change their habits for the long term. And mm -hmm. basically what that, so I've studied habit change. I have a course called Level Up Your Life that um, walks people through habits from an Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine perspective that we all need to thrive. Um, and I also have courses on basics of Chinese medicine. If people really want to geek out, they can go that that <laughs> route. Um, but really it's like just that when I'm working with someone, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm strategizing, call myself a self-care strategist because that's really what it is. It's like, is thinking of, of what is actually going to move the needle for this particular human, whether it is a, a movement strategy, um, an on the plate strategy, or an in the life strategy, or an emotional regulation strategy. And so much of it comes back to awareness and presence. And so uh, like I'll just a, a lot of, um, I'm really interested in, in consciousness itself and helping people become aware of their own tendencies so that we don't have to be bound by them. Amen. So I, but earlier you mentioned like I work with with high achieving women and so generally a lot of a lot of people who are very young and very type A but also a lot of caregivers who put themselves last and end up uh, resenting it and so it's it's uh, yeah. so so working with like with our our habits not only our physical habits what we do in our daily life but also our habits of who we think we need to be in the world in order to stay safe and yeah. so I like to challenge people on that with love and compassion and come up with strategies about how we can be more free. Amen. You're singing my song, girl. I love it. <laughs> so important. So I have one question um, to uh, end our, uh, our interview together with. And I ask all my, I try to ask all my guests. And that is, since this is the Heal Your Hunger show, what is your deepest hunger? My deepest hunger uh, is for love. Mm. I mean, I, like on a soul level, it's like that, you know, my soul, my soul wants love. My soul wants to share love. My soul's nature is love. And that when we have love, we don't necessarily need much else. Amen. I love that. That's so beautiful. And you're such a beautiful embodiment of that and all that you do. So thank you so much for your beautiful work and for who you are. I'm really glad I know you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much for saying that and for inviting me on to talk to your audience. It's, um, it's always a privilege to be able to share Chinese medicine with people. Yeah, so beautiful. You've done a great job of explaining it. So Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Please make sure to continue the conversation in the Secret Sauce group on Facebook and also tune in to our next show. We'll have another amazing guest and, and topic that relates to uh, really things that are most important to emotional eaters. So, Brody, thanks so much. You're just so lovely, and I'm really grateful mm. to have you on the show. 
It's been a pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.